Hello, welcome to Spirit List. My name is Demitokwe David and you're welcome to the adult class. Today is a very, very interesting topic. We'll be talking about evangelism. You know, we hear about evangelism a lot and the question is, whose job is it? Whose job is it really? Our text is going to be taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. Mark chapter 16, verse 14 to 18. Mark chapter 16, verse 14 to 18. As you know, it's important. This is Sunday school. Open your Bibles and you read through it. The central truth for our class today is that doing the work of evangelism is an act of obedience to God, to his command, and must be done by all believers must be done by all believers doing the work of evangelism is an act of obedience to his command and must be done by all believers and you can look at act chapter chapter 1 verse 8 to 9 act chapter 1 verse 8 to 9 and first Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4 a memory verse is taken from the book of mark mark chapter 16 verse 15 to 16 mark chapter 15 verse 16 to, to verse 15 to 16 it says and he said unto them, Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Our evangelism emphasis is that the Great Commission is clearly the desire of God to see the entire world saved through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. The Great Commission is clearly the desire of God to see the entire world saved through the preaching of the gospel of Christ. In this class, we have four outline, four outline, and the first one is must be a believer. The second is must be empowered. The third is must be diligent and compassionate. The fourth must be stewardship conscious, stewardship conscious. You know, I know you've heard about this 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 line evangelism is the heartbeat of god evangelism is the heartbeat of god we say it a lot and preachers and you know people in in, in a christendom we say it a lot but when you think about your loved ones when you think about your loved ones who are yet to accept christ as their lord and savior what comes to your mind or perhaps let me ask you do you understand what separation from a loved one is what separation from a loved one is like eternally See, let me tell you a few things about that. The feeling of being separated from a loved one is, it, is an eternal one and the most profound, painful emotion a person can ever experience, especially when you love them so much. And whilst you're here, you think about it and what, you can, what can be done to avoid this separation at all cost. Even, let's not even take it eternally. You know, sometimes when you look at people around you, and friends, it could be a member of family. How does how do you handle self separation when they are not with you, or sometimes when they are on the sick bed, and they are here, and you don't even have you, you don't even know what to to do. You've explored all medical, you've you've exhausted all medical avenues, every avenue that you know. I mean, if they tell you something that this thing is going to help this person. I'm sure you would definitely give it your best shot. And you would almost stop at nothing to make sure your loved ones are not separated from you at all cost. Now, think about that eternally. The idea is that you would never have the opportunity to be with the person again, not just for a long time, but for all eternity, which means forever and ever without end. So to be more detailed about what this feeling what 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 this feeling can entail yeah it it, it comes it, the first thing is you you want it, it comes with an incomprehensible loss it is the realization that you would never ever see hear or touch or interact with your loved one ever again this loss is not just a period of time like when someone passes away but for all time to come then there is overwhelming grief, which is the sense of suppression, which can lead to profound grief, sadness, sorrow. It's not just the passing feeling of sadness, but a deep and enduring pain that can be hard to bear. And then there is that regret and unfinished business. You may feel regret for things left unsaid or undone with your loved ones. The, 
the finality of separation means that there is no chance, no chance whatsoever to make amends or say goodbye. And this is the point where we have the I die knows moment. And I know I have done that. Then it also leads to intense loneliness, loneliness and sense of emptiness. The person who was once an integral part of your life is now gone forever. And then there's a question of uncertainty. You may grapple with questions about the afterlife and the nature of their existence and what happened to their soul afterwards. The uncertainty of this matter can add a lot of emotional distress. And then there is that yearning and longing. Sometimes you may constantly be yearning to be united with your loved one. And that can lead and, and that can never be can never be fulfilled. When you consider these things deeply, you begin to understand the importance of evangelism to your close member that you love so much, your friends, your family, and people in general. I was privileged by the Lord to see the death of my late grandfather, who was actively a religious and dedicated man to another faith. My grandfather was the most well-meaning man and full of charitable good works. And one day I called and I told my parent about it. I said, listen, this is what the Lord showed me. And it was so real and so detailed as to how he was going and where he was going to be buried. And, you know, there was so much details about it. I left it for a while, but then with, with, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I started to pray for him. I started to pray for the salvation of his soul. And it grew and it became intense. I reminded God that he doesn't want the death of a sinner. That he was merciful to change the heart of anyone. Anyone beyond, there's no one that is beyond saving. It became intense that every day I was praying for him for weeks. I later heard that he came visiting my parents. This, this, he came visiting my parents back home. A um, few weeks into his visit, one day I got a call from my, from my mom. She said, oh, um, uh, grandpa is a little bit ill and, 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 and all sorts. I said, okay, that's all right. I, I'll keep praying for him. And then I called my dad and I said that I want to speak to grandpa if you are with him. But unfortunately, he wasn't with him. So because I had that intense, I had the leading to, 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 to share the gospel with him. I called my dad and said, this was the opportunity to speak to, to him about Christ. And mind you, my father was a, a my father is a pastor as well. And, um, and sometimes when you approach my grandfather about Christ, he would just say, oh, well, aren't we all serving the same God? And it would show off the conversation off and down. And that's, that's it shut down. My dad was not with my granddad when I called him and I couldn't wait to get, I couldn't wait for him to get back home so I could speak to him, you know, because of the distance and not at home. Um, you have to do most of the things electronically by call, WhatsApp and all those things. So I phoned my mom, I phoned my cousin or my mom and fortunately they were, they were, they were at home and with him. And I told him that I wanted to speak with my grandpa. It was like the right and perfect time God appointed. I got on the phone to him and I told him about Christ. There and then, he gave his life. It was such a miracle. I called my dad about this and I told him that, I told him the news and I invited him and encouraged him to continue to share the word of God with him uh, when he gets home and every opportunity he had. So a few days later, I broke bread with him and a couple of days later, he felt very ill and he began to deteriorate quickly. And I continued to pray for him. And every time I had the opportunity to speak with him, I would speak with him, pray with him and break bread with him when I could. And within two weeks, it deteriorated even more. Then my mom called me and said, oh, we're taking grandpa home. And I was so agitated. I got so angry. I said, why are you taking him home? I feel like it, they were taking him home to the midst of the same people we, it was with who, you know, perhaps were almost like an entrance to who were not, you know, you know that word when you, when you find a, find a flame, it begins to burn. So you want to be among people who would encourage you, who would help you build your faith. That was what, that was what my thought. I was like, no, I don't think you should take him home. And then I said, okay, have you asked every, every, the rest of your siblings? And she said, yes, 
she, everybody's in agreement. So I got, I, I really got ag agitated. And since they all agreed to take him on, to take him on. So I insisted that before the journey, before they take the journey, I would like to speak with him. And I broke bread with him and I prayed for him. I was led to tell him that the angels were with him and they're ready to take him home. So afterwards, they go into the car and the, uh, the, uh, uh, they go into the car and the journey home back to his own house began. About 10 minutes when they got into his house, everybody welcomed him and they, they put him on his bed. And 10 minutes later, he passed on. I heard the news and I was, I was so, so shocked first. It wasn't just that I was so shocked. I also was able, I was privileged to break bread with him on that day. I mean, it's such a huge miracle. This is somebody who was shot Christ down. This is somebody who, listen, praying for your siblings and family members. It's beyond, you don't even, prayer works. And knowing that, he made it. I had peace of mind that when I come, by the time I come back, when the Lord wants me back home, I would see him there. Yes, listen, when you see the light, you cannot live in darkness anymore. When you're so accustomed to the light, you can never be comfortable with darkness again. The thought of hearing loved ones weeping and crying on the other end and you being saved i mean do you not think about it do you not think about the agony and the pain and yes they rejected christ but there is a place for prayer and praying for people and praying that the lord really has an encounter with them and the lord really helped them the work of repentance salvation it's not our job it is the job of the holy spirit to bring people to bring conviction to people and your job is to pray and open your mouth and speak to that person now thinking about that the fact that your loved ones your husband your wife your children that you love so much your mom your dad, your grandparent, that you share a lot with, that you share a dinner party with, you have dinner, you cook for, you laugh, you visit, you go, you buy stuff, you give them presents. Think about it. And then when they pass on, you're not even sure where they are. And there is that opportunity to pray for them and ask the Holy Spirit to, to touch them. It is, it is, even when you think about it right now, it's, it comes with so much pain and grief. I mean, the, the Lord was showing me something and I was weeping. I was like, God, have mercy. And it's important that you take evangelism serious. See, let's take away the word evangelism. Have a conversation with these people. Evangelism is talking about Christ is praying for somebody that the Lord will convict them and bring them to, to himself. It is the heart desire of God. When you make, when you see God answers prayers, it is the will of God that all men come to the Lord. Because it is the will of God, the Lord answers such prayer. And in fact, he does it with speed. I want to ask you, knowing all and knowing this, who do you think should evangelize as a Christian? Good works does not take people to heaven. Oh, he's a nice guy, he's amazing. He, 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 he gives to charity, he gave all his property to charity. It doesn't take people to heaven. The picture of being in heaven and having my beloved one cry out from the other side is so horrifying. Now that you're a Christian, 
and Jesus has saved you and you have a hope of a glorious future, what is the point if you cannot preach the gospel with your loved ones? Do you have a picture of hell? Do you understand it? Now tell me, whose job is it to preach the gospel? See, Jesus enacted the Great Commission when he commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. It was his final charge of evangelism, of evangelism to the church just before he ascended into heaven. Evangelism is the art of preaching, talking to somebody, proclaiming the good news of Christ to the lost people of this world. You have a hope. Give somebody else a hope too. You have a hope of a glorious future. Give that hope to somebody by opening your mouth and talking to that person. The aim is to bring people to God's saving, saving grace. It is not only to escape from hell. This is the main kingdom business of, of the church. It is not necessarily the job of those who have access to a huge platform and pulpit, or for only those with the ministry of the gift of evangelist or, or, or the gift of the evangelist, but an assignment of all born again believers. It is expected that you organize evangelist, evangelist, evangelistic outreach, you know, sometimes uh, prayer sessions for people to be saved. We are not just praying, God bless me. God is going to bless you. God blesses people. He blesses people. That, there's no doubt in it. God blesses people. He changes. In fact, God can bless you within an hour, within 24 hours. God can do it. But how about other people dying? People are losing their life every day. The enemy is snatching people away. Your loved ones are in great, your loved ones that are not safe are in great danger, and you have a hope. Please give this hope to somebody. It is expected that you organize evangelistic outreach where you can, you know, and programs and prayer sessions. There is a need for personalized involvement as a believer, and everyone is expected to target his household. His neighbors, his colleagues, his schools, his work, workplace, and business associates, as well as beyond. It's not just for you. It's not just for you. Give others hope. People are dying without knowing where they're going. People are slumming away. The cares of this world are snatching the people away. Please, open your mouth and say something. Open your mouth and pray. Have a heart. When you think about the torment, you would not want anybody to go away from you and not be saved. Imagine putting your hands in fire. Now, compare that to a fire that burns continuously every single day. And it's such an agony thinking about it. It is an agony thinking that you would let anyone go through that. Please, please preach the gospel. Please. God, God's going to do a whole lot, but the soul of people are the most important. Organize prayer sessions for people to be saved. God answers those sort of prayers quicker. Have a journal of people you want saved from your school, from your neighborhood, from your community. Even that person who gets on your nerve needs saving. In your business places, your business associate, and you know, and your immediate vicinity. There are many kinds of evangelism, there are personal evangelism. Educational evangelism, mass evangelism, electronic evangelism like social media. Thus, every, every saved person is a debtor to the unsaved. Okay? In fact, I can stop my message here, but I'm going to, I can stop Sunday school here, but I'm going to go through all of the, <laughs> all of the commentaries, which is um, the outline and, and stuff. So, having established the fact that evangelism is the heart, desire of God. 
It is therefore expected to be the main aspect of the kingdom business on earth. Who should do the business of evangelism and what are the qualifications? In this lesson, we shall be discussing what qualifies a man to do the work of evangelism. First, you must be a believer. That is outright. You cannot talk to people about somebody you do not know. In fact, you know what? I want to encourage you to listen to the lesson for the teenagers. I did expand a little bit on that as well. I mean, we are talking about evangelism this time. And please, just, just, just take a moment. Although it says teenagers or teen Sunday school, see, the gospel is, doesn't have age. God uses anybody. A, a baby, the Bible says, out of the mouth of baby and, so, and suckling tears. So they pray. <laughs> Sometimes, and let's not have this, you know, a mindset of oh, what what does she have to say or what 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 was what's she saying or we need to always approach the things of god with a with a fresh open mind the bible says that his mercies are new every morning the mercies of god are new so yesterday's mercy is different that's yesterday is gone every encounter you have with the word has to be fresh our approach should not be over i've heard that before Oh, I think I've heard what is it that she wants to say or what it is that she's got to say. That's not how to approach the things of God. That's not how to approach God. We have to have an open mind. Okay? So I, I would like to encourage you to to I would like to encourage you to 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 also listen to, to, to the teenagers class on the school as well. So you cannot preach again. You must be a believer. To, you cannot preach Christ that you do not know, that you do not have an encounter with. You know, one, you must surrender your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and be born again. And this must be accompanied by a transformed lifestyle of, of, of Christian character that befits one as an ambassador of Christ. It entails the capacity to tell people why Christ came to the world and what he accomplished. accomplished on our behalf through sharing personal experiences with others. So you you have to have an encounter with God and you have to share your testimony of how the Lord saved you and the things that he has done through it. Now, also you must be empowered. You must be empowered. Another qualification for the work of evangelism is the endowment of the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Acts chapter one verse six says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me you know you have to receive power the gospel is the power of Christ of Christ unto everyone not unto some unto everyone so that means that the Holy Spirit wants to empower you the Holy Spirit wants to empower you empower you to do the work of ministry want to empower you to do it to, to do it well Power evangelism means the exercise of spiritual authority accompanied by the manifestations of signs, miracles, and wonders. See, when you preach the gospel, miracles happen. I'm telling you, especially when you allow the Holy Spirit and you receive it from the Lord, miracles happen. Signs, wonders, miracles happen. Every And every believer has, the, has this capacity by faith. This is why I encourage the baptism of the Holy Spirit after salvation. The Holy Spirit in us, in you, it guides you to people that God wants to speak with. It puts the right words in your mouth and empowers those words with authority to convict the hearers. Okay? So you must be empowered. You also must be diligent and compassionate. You cannot preach to, you. if you don't have compassion, you would just say, mm, well, I don't want to talk to this person. This person doesn't look like the person I want to talk to. I want to talk to that person. Maybe they would agree. To do the work of evangelism, you must be burdened with God's burden. Because it is the desires of God that God, that, that all men may come through the knowledge of Christ. And that must burden you. And you must have compassion for souls. You must be acquainted with the word of God and how to use the word of God. You must be willing to do the work even when it is not convenient. You know, this is the most, you know, this is the most difficult part. You might be on a rush to be somewhere or to be somewhere, and the Lord is asking you, talk to this person just for a second or a minute. Sometimes because you're focused or tunnel vision or, 
you're focused on that thing, you just want to do it done, done, done. Or sometimes you have uh, an idea of how you think you should preach the gospel and you're just rigid in that way and the Holy Spirit wants you to do it in another way. Sometimes it could be inviting somebody for, over for dinner and have the conversation over for dinner. Sometimes it's, it, it can just be little things like just asking the person how they are. So it's not like there's a thought process, done, 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 done. I speak this, I say this, I say this, I'd make them do this. No, you need to allow fluidity for the Holy Spirit to walk through you. Okay, again, you also must be a steward, you must be uh, stewardship, you must be conscious of stewardship. Every believer must give an account of your stewardship to God. This is not because, this is because not being involved in evangelism will amount to being disobedient and, unfruitful, and, and, and an unfruitful branch. There are consequences of remaining spiritually barren. A good steward must be given to prayer and will, and, and will prayerfully consider the soul of the unsaved and make a conscious effort to be a vessel through which they may receive salvation. Now, in conclusion to our, our class, God has eternal reward for all soul winners. Hence, if I, see, if you are just, I'm sorry, if, you, if you're just thinking about the reward, I don't know. Of course, there is a reward for every soul that you win and, you know, the kind of... But beyond that, it's coming from a place of compassion, a place of love, a place that you desire that you do not suffer eternally. That alone, that alone is more than enough. But obviously, there, 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 is, there, is, there is reward for, for, for evangelism and soul winning. And these are some, these are this is these are the, the highest form of service, you know. Being an apostle, being a prophet, being all of this is good. Being a pastor, being but the highest is you preaching the gospel, because it is the heartbeat of God, the desire of God. It is what God wants. And when you go down on your knees and pray for that person and pray for that community, pray for that school, pray for your business, or pray for the people that come to your business, pray for the people that you work with, God answers those prayers even with speed because that is the will of God. And it's, you know, what, you know what, what, what they say when you pray in the will of God, when you are praying in the will of God, it gets answered. And will you not tell me that even when you are here, there is reward for you. Everything that, the, that you do, there is reward. Okay? So please and please take, take it serious. Take talking about Christ serious. If you want to remove the big grammar of saying evangelism, have a conversation with people about Christ. That's, that's, all, that's, that's what it's all about. Talk to them about it. Tell them what the Lord has done for you, what he can do and what he's capable of doing. And you will see him even work in your own situation. Okay? So there is a reward. God has eternal reward for all soul winners. Hence, evangelism and soul winning are supreme task of all, believe, of all believers. The practice must be passed from one generation to another until all peoples and the nations are reached. While we wait for the return of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, he that wins souls is wise. Now, join the conversation, please. I know this, this is a very dicey and it, it touches my heart as well. I want to ask you, if you, if you don't mind, put it in the comment sec section. So the, the first question is, is evangelism meant for only, only certain believers such as pastors and evangelists? evangelists? Um, I, we have, I have dealt with that in the question, but, but it, it's nice to also put your perspective to it. And then again, should the work of evangelism be done by only those who are members of the evangelic, evangelism team of a local church? Obviously, you know the answer already through this. And again, what are the, advantage, the advantages of power evangelism? What are the advantages of power evangelism? Please share this video, like it, please, and leave a comment. You have not come to the end of the Sunday School till I come your way some other time. Have a wonderful evening. Take care.
and God bless you.